Hi everyone, welcome to Get Well with Dr. Shell. I am Dr. Shalina Lalji, better known as Dr. Shell, and I know as a board certified OBGYN and a functional medicine expert, your health is unique and deeply personal. It is a combination of genetics, lifestyle, and environment. Know this, no matter what your starting point is, you are never powerless over your health. Being on a health journey is a marathon, not a sprint. This podcast is about walking you through many different perspectives on health conditions, symptoms, and solutions that can help you get from fatigued to fabulous. My mission has always been to offer my patients and community the best of mental, physical, and spiritual wellness. You can learn more about me and my wellness center and schedule your telehealth appointment at drshell.com. We can support you no matter where you are in the world. This podcast is a powerful and simple way to carry the wisdom of thought leaders from around the world in your pocket and continue to develop your own healing journey every single day. So let the journey begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of Get Well with Dr. Shell. Today we have with us Dr. Kirk Gear, a chiropractor who specializes in low-level non-thermal lasers. He has taught laser therapy for the last five years and has researched so many different lasers and has published in the Journal of Orthopedics and Rheumatology. Dr. Gear has used lasers in his practice to help with a litany of ailments ranging from Hashimoto's thyroiditis, neurodegenerative diseases, autism, body fat reduction, injuries, fractures, chronic pain, and even for sports performance enhancement, and especially to support for concussions, something that I obviously feel very strongly about in the field of neurodegeneration. He has worked with celebrities, sports champions, gold medalists, and even world record holders. Welcome, Dr. Gare. I'm so happy to have a fellow laser enthusiast on our show today. Well, thank you for having me. It's quite an honor to be here and a privilege. I'm excited to share this information with, uh, with your listeners out there because this can really change people's lives in a, in a way that doesn't have any side effects. So that's really great when you can have something that's quite effective and not really any risks. Well, that's awesome. I'm all about non-invasive, non-surgical modalities. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what our entire practice is based on. We do functional medicine and then a lot of aesthetics, which is, you know, again, non-surgical is kind of the key because who has time for downtime, right? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, So we use a lot of lasers in our wellness and aesthetic center here in Houston. And I first had seen the wonders that it does for all types of health issues Mm -hmm. and for other aesthetic procedures, you know, anything from skin resurfacing, varicose veins for the skin. I could really go on and on, but we only have a short period of time. Let's go right in. Could you go into the type of lasers that you use in your practice? Sure. And what kind of results do you see? Sure. So what you can see that, you know, I've got lasers on my head right now. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a transcranial laser therapy here. Uh, This one is the Erconia FX 635. So these are visible red lasers that are 635 nanometers. There's three diodes that rotate around. This is my go-to one for when I'm doing uh, work with, like for myself, I played 11 years of football, including college football. So a lot of concussions and then multiple car accidents. I use this on my brain to deal with those long-term effects from playing that sport. Uh, so we see great improvements with, the, with patients with those cases, even patients who've had strokes or uh, uh, there's a lot of good research on lasers for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's um, that, that's been coming out of the uh, uh, out in, in studies recently. So I've been using these since 2004. The other one I also use from Merconia, this is, these are all non-thermal. So that's a key thing. Certain lasers are gonna be heat producing and thermal, particularly for the brain. We don't wanna use anything that creates heat on the brain. So we use these non-thermal lasers. This one that I have here is a handheld one that mm-hmm. combines lasers that are uh, violet and also red. And the great thing about the violet wavelength is there's a lot of antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial effects there. So like, as we talk about neurodegeneration, I'll often stack this to where I'll have the violet red combination uh, over the vagus nerve, even coming down to the gut 
and do vagal nerve exercises while we're doing brain rehab as well. So we see great things with that. I have athletes who come in for a lot of times initially for an injury. And then with the lasers, we can actually enhance their performance. And there was a, a study published in the uh, Journal of Biophotonics and another one in the Journal of Athletic Training in 2017 that said that athletes who get laser therapy before and after uh, sports performance, that it's as if they get uh, uh, performance enhancing drugs because they perform so much better, muscles are stronger, more endurance, faster recovery, that they even question whether it should be allowed in the Olympics and international competition because there's such a profound difference. So we see that with fractures, we get those to heal at least 30 to 50% faster. Um, at, at anywhere on the body, shoulders, knees, back, uh, plantar fasciitis, all these things it works quite well for. We even do pre and post-op therapies and we can get patients who, to recover from a surgery anywhere at least 35% faster up to 70% faster. And I have a lot of cool case studies I can share with you on that too. So, yeah, so yeah. you know, excellent information. Um, that's, that's a wide array of yes. potential uses. So that's number one, mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. Now, what I'd like to ask you is, what is the science behind it? I want our audience to really understand sure. what is the laser light therapy okay. doing? What is it doing to the body? So we'll kind of take it down and, you know, divide it into different categories, right? Sure. Right. So you talked about inflammation and injuries. Let's start right. with that. How does it impact that with the tissue joints? Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And I think to give people understanding is let's bring it to something we can all relate to. Let's think about plants. So this is what I tell patients when they come into the office. I tell them, you know, look at the laser here and you can see it, it looks unimpressive. It looks like a barcode scanner or a laser leveler, but sure. let's pretend my hand is a plant's leaf. And when sunlight hits that plant's leaf, there are photoreceptive cells yes. that will absorb the photons of energy from sunlight and then turn it into food through photosynthesis. And that will go from the leaf to all parts of the plant. So it doesn't just stay in the leaf, it gets spread globally. Uh, in our bodies, if we go to the beach and you know sunlight hits us, we can make uh, melanin for a nice suntan, vitamin D that goes throughout the body for healthy bones and, it's, and a good immune system, melatonin for your sleep wake cycle, et cetera. Now, when we get a laser, so let's say as I put the laser here on me, I'm not gonna make food or vitamin D, but I am gonna make uh, things like ATP, which is an energy molecule that your cells use for every single function that, that you need. We're also gonna dampen inflammation. So it has this impact on all these, uh, people have heard about the inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6. Well, numerous studies show that laser can calm down interleukin-6, that it actually has this anti-inflammatory effect. And in numerous studies, it shows that it's not only equal to opioids and NSAID medications, but actually superior to them because not only do we, do we calm down like the prostaglandin pathways and the COX-1 and COX-2 pathways, but we also stimulate tissue to repair because as I have the laser on me, I'm going to stimulate stem cell production. So we're making these stem cells, or if I, when I have it here on my brain, it's right. going to impact the stem cells that are in the bone marrow. And then they're going to move to the surface of the brain through these little uh, channels that Harvard discovered in 2018 and to the surface of the brain to help clear out amyloid beta and tau protein misfoldings and to improve blood flow and to dampen inflammation, all these different things that occur. Super important in neurological yeah. diseases. Very I mean, important. In amyloid, you know, you've got Alzheimer's, you've got Parkinson's, you've got ALS, mm -hmm. you've got MS. Um, right. So, you know, you're reducing inflammation, Correct. you are promoting energy, mm -hmm. you are promoting healing, Exactly. you are reducing protein misfolding, right. you are stimulating stem cell production and function. Exactly. How long do you have to, does a patient need to have this laser light therapy on them to be able to so, do that? So that varies from patient to patient. So let's say if I'm dealing with uh, just a patient who's been, had a concussion, I, I treat a lot of athletes and patients who've been in auto accidents with a concussion. We have to kind of assess that person too, because if they're really, really um, kind of fragile in a sense, you know, some people after a concussion, they can't handle any light or sound. Then we might only start with a couple of minutes of the laser therapy on them, or even on the body, just so that we can get that energy to start to, to uh, dampen the inflammation in the brain. And then also promote a proper response from the glial cells, these immune cells in the brain as well. So it might only initially be a couple of minutes, with more chronic patients, it might go up to 10 or even 20 minutes with some patients. So this is where the practitioner also has to kind of determine what are we going to do with this patient. And one of the things I do with working with those patients is we'll, we'll determine what they're weak at. Like, let's say I'll have a, a, a patient come in with some kind of a brain condition where maybe they have uh, word searching. 
So we'll put the laser on them and then we play word games with them. We'll have them go through, say, the alphabet and come up with words for uh, uh, different letters of the alphabet. Or we might have them do an app on their phone, like the Duolingo app, to try to do some uh, foreign language exercises. And we do that to their tolerance, to where they start to feel fatigued. And as soon as they're fatigued, then we stop. And it's just like exercising. We, we see how many minutes did it take to get to their fatigue point, And then we use that as our baseline for how we progress on there. So many patients, we usually expect some kind of a change in that first session is what we're looking for, maybe somewhere at a 10% or 20% change in there. Obviously, that depends on how bad they are. If I got someone who's got a really bad stroke or who's pretty progressed with, say, Parkinson's or another uh, neurodegenerative condition, that's different. That's going to take longer and they'll need more total treatments. And with a lot of the neurodegenerative conditions, they'll need some type of maintenance treatment on there as well. Of course, of course, yeah. you know, again, just to reemphasize, it's a non-invasive, non-surgical mm-hmm. modality, and it is giving you so much, um, so much benefit and using right. your own body's ability to heal. It's just exactly. enhancing your own body's ability to heal, which is, you know, what our field of study is now is, right. you know, really getting your body to become optimal at exactly. doing of the healing and providing it with all the um, nourishment and the uh, protocols that we talk about. Yeah, so absolutely. Fantastic. Can you explain the differences between LED light therapy, mm-hmm. the low level lasers that you sure. use mostly, and the high intensity layer lasers that you know we might have in the aesthetic practice sure. we see around uh, the country? Yeah, so that's a great question because get people get confused a lot, especially that's since a, a lot of the a lot of product makers mislabel their product too. So there's a lot of LED, which is light emitting diode products that are out there that are labeled and call themselves laser. Uh, to try to capitalize off of the research on that. So when we look at lasers, lasers were first researched in the 1960s. By, the, by 1974, the Soviet Union was so thrilled with them that they made them part of their state-sponsored standard medical care. So they were being used, uh, low-level lasers were being used for OBGYN, even oncology, neurology, pediatrics, all these different types of types of, of uh, conditions. And they were primarily using a 635 nanometer laser, which is a visible red laser. So you've got lasers that can be visible red, they can be near infrared, far infrared, different wavelengths have different effects on the, on the body. And when we look at most of the research on light therapy or laser therapy, it's mostly on lasers uh, because lasers have a different kind of energy to them since the, the light is coming out in parallel, we call coherent beams. So it has a different kind of a photobiochemical effect. So what we're trying to do with lasers is we're trying to, as we get this on here, is to stimulate some photobiochemical changes that won't just stay here, but also go globally throughout the body. So we could be trying to create nitric oxide to improve blood flow, uh, or glutathione to, you know, dampen inflammation as a really good uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 way to fight free radicals. With LEDs, they're less expensive. They're not coherent. They do have an impact. They definitely have an impact. I think those are great for home use, for patients to do, for, for a maintaining therapy at home, since, you know, they're in the few hundred dollar ranges, whereas in lasers, we get into the several thousand up to like this unit here is like a 40 some thousand dollar unit. So it's not practical for patients to use at home. When we look at the studies that got FDA clearance in all of those LEDs were used as the control and they did show that there was an impact, but it was about 10% of what the actual lasers were. So you're still going to get some, some photobiochemical changes uh, with the LED devices, but it's just more enhanced according to the current research out there. I know this is a controversial topic, but if you look at what we can find on PubMed, more, most of it is on the actual lasers that are coherent. Um, and then we look at high intensity lasers. Those ones can be anything from surgical ones to do you know, uh, incisions, et cetera, or ones that are to try to say, treat a deep arthritic joint where you're trying to induce heat in there. Many times those ones require you to put direct contact on the joint, and then you have to wear safety goggles at all times. Uh, so they work under a different mechanism by trying to you know, thermally heat up the joints or heat up the tissues, et cetera, um, uh, in a different mechanism than with a low level non-thermal lasers. So they all have their place, just depending on what you're trying to work on. You just don't want to use those thermal devices on the brain or near the thyroid or anything because they are uh, heat sensitive tissues. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned a word that I want to kind of talk about a little bit next, and that is the thyroid. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's let's switch gears to the thyroid. I think you did a great job explaining and uh, over, you know, overviewing the whole, uh, what we can do for neurodegenerative diseases might come yeah. back to that in a second. Sure, I have a great case study I'd love to share with you too. Later. Oh so, yes, okay, oh yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so why don't I let you share that 
first. Okay. I mean, that first because I want to stay with the neurodegenerative until okay. um, we're ready to switch gears. Okay. So one of my most profound case studies is with my office manager's brother. So she's been with me for about seven years now, and she was one of my original patients. She started as a patient when she was 19. She's now in her 40s. So she's been around me watching my practice kind of grow. And she saw all the things we'd been doing with patients over these years with lasers. And she asked me, she said, hey, do you think this could help my brother? So what had happened with her brother was 30 years ago, when he was just uh, about eight months old, she and her brother were sitting on their couch at uh, their babysitter's house in East LA. And a city of LA worker was drunk and on cocaine. And he drove his city vehicle through the wall of the babysitter's house oh. and hit them while they were on the couch. So they go flying, she gets injured, not quite as badly as her brother, but her brother suffers massive head trauma to where at one point they were talking with Liz's mom and saying, hey, you know, we really think you should take your son off of life support. His organs can be harvested for, you know, other kids. And the mom was like, no, what I want to, I want to try to save my son. So, you know, they fought for, fought for him and he had some surgeries and he came through it. But when he came through it, initially he was, he was blind in the left eye. He had uh, some left-sided paralysis as well. And over time he started to get the vision back, but he had no movement. So he couldn't move his eyes to the left at all. When he would walk, he would drift to the left. He didn't use his left arm much. And he cognitively was about at the level of a 10 year old. They said he was kind of like their yes man. So he didn't really make opinions for himself. He just sure. went along with the flow of whatever. And when we started doing the laser, cause she said, well, do you think it can help him? I said, I don't know. This is a 30 year old injury. I don't know if there's anything we could do, but I know the laser won't hurt. So let's just try it. And you tell me if you think it'll work or not. So what I did a basic premise with laser therapy is whatever patient is weak at, we're going to laser him and try to stimulate that pathway. So I yes. put this laser on his head and I knew he can't move his eyes to the left. So let's just try to get him to do some cardinal fields of gaze. And I try to stimulate him with a pen light, uh, you know, just to activate that optic nerve pathway. And over time, at first he couldn't move it. About two weeks later, he got a little blip to move it to the left. And about another two weeks after that, he could, he could move it all the way out and hold it a little bit after. So that made us know we're really waking up these different you know, neural networks in the brain. He got to where he could look and even hold his vision. And then he stopped drifting to the left when he would uh, walk. I also would start uh, having him try to passively move the arm while we applied the laser. I'd use these different tools to stimulate different proprioceptive pathways for let him know where his body was in space. I also used an adjuster tool along the spine to stimulate these what are called afferent mechanoreceptors, which are sensory uh, uh, neurons that tell your body where you are in space that we wanted to stimulate the brain with that. So we were doing all this while the laser was on him. And the amazing thing happened is he started being able to use his left arm even after 30 years to where he could open up a, a bottle or a bag. Uh, uh, but the real amazing thing was with his cognitive functioning was normally Brian didn't know when his birthday would be hmm. and he wouldn't really plan for his birthday or anything. But the first year that we started doing the laser, things changed about a month before his birthday. He goes to his mom and says, hey, mom, my birthday's coming next month, right? And she said, yeah, Brian, why? And they were already surprised that he realized that. But he said, well, here's why I want a taco caterer. I want a magician and I want these friends brought. This one doesn't have a ride. So you're gonna have to pick them up. This one, you'll have to talk to this person to get wow. it. And he had this all mapped out and they're really blown away. They're like, oh my God, he's never planned things like this. So they thought, okay, we'll do this. But they said, you know what, Brian, the magician's kind of expensive. He had asked for one in the past and they had gotten him in the past. And so what they would do when he would ask for it again, they would say, well, Brian, just go watch the DVD. And he'd usually say, okay, I'll just watch the DVD. Well, after we started doing the laser, he realized it wasn't the same. And he had his argument. He said, no, mom, it's not the same experiencing it live versus watching this, uh, this video. So we saw him continue to improve like that. He got to where when he'd go back to his group home for activities, he couldn't hang out with his old friends anymore because he was now on a different cognitive level. And the instructors at the facility noticed it. They're like, hey, what's going on with Brian? It's like his brain is waking up. Even his neurologist said the same thing. His neurologist had been with him for over 20 years. And they said, what are you, what are you doing different to Brian? I said, why? He, and he said, it's like his brain is waking up. I'm seeing activity and things we thought were, were dead. And he continues to get better. Uh, he even got to the point where he came into the office and, and Liz says, hey, Brian, show, show uh, Dr. Gare how you can imitate dad. So this is a guy who didn't have much use of his left arm or left leg and would walk crooked. He now can do an impression of his dad because he saw his dad getting up to walk across the room and his dad does a, a physical job. So he'd be like, ah, ah, ah. So he could imitate his dad getting out of a chair and walking in the noises that he makes. So it's a profound difference in a short period of time. Yeah. And he continues to get better. You know, that's the yeah. great thing. Yeah. You, well, it almost seems like you woke him up. Mm -hmm. The laser, you know, the, mm -hmm. all the treatments that you've been doing with him, you almost woke him up one more exactly. time to where right. you know, he would have been 
And that just goes to show, and you know, we um, study a lot of literature and I, I've, gosh, read countless um, articles and books on neural networks and neural yeah. pathways and the plasticity, neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. Um, right. And, you know, the, the things that are wired together, fire mm, together. Exactly. Right. It's the, mm -hmm. what Dr. Joe Dispenza always says, you know, right. all the pathways that fire together, wire together. And, right. and then it makes you kind of think, can you regenerate neurons? Can right. you generate motor neurons? Mm -hmm. Is it possible? Uh, what would you yeah. say about that? Because there's a lot of conditions where, you know, a lot of things have, you know, if they've kind of gone... Um, dormant it's a right. different story than a tretic or you know when they've completely died right i agree with you and i and I, i've read the same thing as some that say it's possible to regenerate some that say that's not like i've taken a lot of training from dr karazian and he he says it's not possible to generate new neurons but i know regardless what we do do is we do improve that neural network and the connectivity so like when i get this laser and i put it on my brain one of the things I'm going to stimulate is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And we're going to cause synaptogenesis where we're going to make more connections between those networks that are left there. And so, uh, you know, I can't prove one way or the other it, whether we're generating new neurons or not, but definitely we're seeing these changes. And I think it, if nothing else, we're, we're wiring around the damage and we're making these new connections. And then the other really important thing we look at whether it's a neurodegenerative condition or let's say a patient who's had multiple concussions like NFL players with right. chronic traumatic encephalopathy. One of the first studies that Dr. Karajan gave to me when I was going through a lot of stuff with my wife was one that showed that getting a red laser on the brain can modulate these immune cells, the glial cells in the brain that if people have watched the movie like Concussion with Will Smith or sure. the Netflix special Inside the Mind of a Killer, the Aaron Hernandez special, you see that when these glial cells get activated, they can chew up the brain and make a honeycomb type of appearance. And when we get the laser on here, it, it calms that down. So you're not making that honeycomb and then you're now rewiring around the damage. So you get some really great benefits that they don't completely understand why but we see these changes. And I think that's very important because, you know, a lot of conditions and we don't know what causes a lot of the neurodegenerative conditions. Right. Could it be autoimmune? Yes, there yes. are components mm -hmm. of that. Could it be neuroinflammation? Yes, there right. are components of that. Could it be glutamate excitotoxicity? Mm -hmm, Could it be mm -hmm. the microglia not doing right. what it needs to do? Mm -hmm. And if we can, and this is how I've always looked at every condition is, you look at the root causes right. of what is causing all of this neuroinflammation, which then cause the symptomatic conditions that we call certain things. We call right. it ALS, we call it MS, we call it Parkinson's. But if we can go back and just rewind and take care of all of that autoimmune stuff, inflammatory exactly. stuff, then we will most likely start making small changes and we don't know yeah. what, what we will get no uh, you don't we hope we mm -hmm. hope that we will get some good resolution yeah. you also mentioned at uh one point earlier in our discussion when we were talking before the podcast um you have some training in functional neurology right. and there was some uh recent publications on autism talk right. about that a little bit yes of, yeah yeah, so, so I, I did, I took courses from Dr. Karazian, uh, and I, I, are you familiar with Dr. Karazian? Uh, yes. So, yeah, so he and I were actually classmates back at uh, chiropractic school, and he was so far ahead of his time that in 1996, he was running functional medicine labs on me as one of his classmates. So it was really okay. cool to you know, know someone as they came up. So yeah, he had me present on lasers to the International Association of Functional Neurology and Rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we we're talking about is with this particular laser here, Erconia did a quadruple blind study on autistic kids in Cuba. And so in that they compared a laser to an LED device and they received uh, eight treatments. They were, uh, they were eight uh, five minute treatments that they received on their brains. And then the LED group six months later received the actual laser uh, therapy. So what they found with these kids was that there were no side effects, but that things like their um, aberrant behavior and non-compliance uh, and, and inappropriate speech dramatically improved with the laser therapy. There wasn't really a change with the LED for those, for those kids, but for the laser, they had a huge change. And then they also did functional MRIs because a lot of people say, well, how the heck can this light penetrate through the, through the bone? So they wanted to show what happens as far as the changes in the brain. They did a functional MRI that showed the change in neuronal activity and blood flow in the brain, and particularly showed that there's a lot more activity in the frontal lobes and in the cerebellum, which are important areas for autistic, autistic kids. And then uh, we've been using this for, for, for support in the office as that study has been submitted to the FDA for hopefully the first um, 
clearance for treating autistic kids. But in the meantime, we've been using this for, for our autistic kids to provide support by dampening inflammation. And we can oftentimes see changes in their behavior, even in that one session. So I have a friend of mine that I went to high school with who has an autistic son. And so she wanted to bring him in. When he would come in, you could hear him kicking and screaming at the door. No, 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 I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. And he'd get in the room and he'd try to punch me and try to kick me. So I'm in there like bobbing and weaving like I'm a prize fighter, you know. And what <laughs> I would do is I'd have my laser, my handheld laser, and I'd just get it over his head like this as he's trying to hit me and kick me. And what would happen with him is in about three minutes, he'd kind of start to calm down. And then he'd sit down on the, on the table and then I could get this laser on him. And you'd see a big change in his behavior in that, you know, 10 minute session that we would do. And even at the first session, he's like, bye doctor, you know, saying bye to me, even gave me a hug. And I, I asked my friend, I said, Hey, does he just normally get used to people and have this reaction? And she said, no, if you didn't have the laser on him, he'd still be trying to punch you and kick you the whole time. And what was cool is she said that those results would last him for a couple of weeks and then they gradually taper away, but he had improved behavior during that time. Um, I've got another kid who would come in. His attention span was literally 12 seconds. He was always on, he was six years old. He was always on YouTube, just looking at videos and not watching anything. So what we did with him is we sat him on his dad's lap, put the laser on him while he looked at videos. And in, in three sessions, his attention span went from 12 seconds to six minutes. So we saw some really cool changes with him. And then what I love is then um, the independent uh, like tutors and other specialists that are working with him. The, we have the parents not say anything because we want to see objectively if they notice a difference, because then usually they'll say, oh, my God, your, your son or your daughter is doing so much better. And, and then they'll report back. Yeah, they did. They noticed a difference, which is great that we can get someone who's blinded to the fact that we're doing lasers uh, actually corroborate, corroborate what we're doing. Fantastic. That's fantastic. You know, and when you say 12 seconds to six minutes, you know, an average person might think, oh, well, that's not too much. But if you talk to a parent of an autistic yes. child, that is huge. It's huge. And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it makes such a huge difference in the quality of life for right. um, these, you know, kids as well as their families. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. I want to switch gears just a little bit sure. and talk about um, Hashimoto's. Sure. My um, audience is, uh, you know, very, very well versed with thyroid conditions. A lot of my patients obviously come in for thyroid conditions. And uh, I find that Hashimoto's is such an underdiagnosed condition. It is. Definitely. You and I know this in the field of functional mm -hmm. medicine, because when we see a patient, we're going to test for, you right. know, thyroid antibodies and reverse T3 and free T3, right. T4, TSH, but most people have not had these uh, tested even. Right. So if somebody comes in or, you know, if somebody who's listening has thyroid conditions or suspects that they have thyroid mm -hmm. conditions, you know, we would of course um, diagnose that. Say they once get diagnosed with Hashimoto's, what is the role of um, low-level laser treatment with Hashimoto's and how does it scientifically and you know, physiologically, mm -hmm. how does it work? Okay, that's a great question. And the, the, there's a great study by, or actually a series of studies by Dr. Hoffling, H-O-F-L-I-N-G. They're known as the Brazil studies out of uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. He started doing laser therapy on, on Hashimoto's patients. I believe it was clear back in uh, like 2012 or 13, and even did long-term six-year follow-ups on these patients. So he was able to show that low-level laser therapy, it's not yet FDA cleared for this. So this is definitely an off-label type of a use, but he was able to show in his studies that let's say if he did an ultrasound pre and post of doing, uh, I, I believe it was like 10 th uh, sessions of laser therapy, he was able to show improved blood flow and also improved tissue on uh, follow-up ultrasound. So it was actually theoretically regenerating some of the thyroid tissue as well. Now in lab tests, he was able to show that TPO antibodies decreased. This is particularly significant because one of the things I learned from Dr. Karazian was that it's missed by a lot of practitioners is that those thyroid, those TPO antibodies can cross react with the cerebellum and create a lot of neurodegenerative types of conditions that can, that can trigger like anxiety and panic attacks. It can trigger dysautonomia, which a lot of Hashimoto sufferers have with the, you know, ir irregular heartbeats and elevated blood pressure and uh, elevated pulse. Um, also vestibular disturbances like, you know, motion sickness, uh, those can all be triggered by these thyroid antibodies cross-reacting with the cerebellum. So he, Hoffling was able to show that laser calmed down those antibodies. So that's a really, really powerful thing. And he was able to show that patients needed less 
thyroid medication over the time. I believe in the study, I hope I don't get this wrong, but I think it was like 45 or 47% didn't even need their medications after he was doing the laser on them. And he did six year follow-ups with them. So that was a pretty significant thing. So when you stack this on top of, obviously you have to look at all the autoimmune things, because let's say someone's got a gluten reaction and a casein reaction and they're pounding down, you know, donuts and stuff like that. No right. matter how much lasering we're doing, you're still ramping up the destruction. So you're not, you're, as we're putting out one fire, they're triggering another fire on the other side. So you got to make sure you, you manage all of that stuff. Chronic infections. That's where I love using this violet and red uh, laser combination here, because we know that uh, chronic infections are there for a lot of um, autoimmune sufferers, especially Hashimoto's. We also know for neurodegeneration that these things can crawl up from the gut into the brain, trigger inflammation and cause those protein misfoldings. So the laser has benefits for also preventing that. And then we look at uh, Dr. Karazian talks about nitric oxide and glutathione being very important for kind of taming autoimmune reactions. Well, a couple of things that laser stimulates is nitric oxide and also glutathione. So if we can increase those, then we also help the body to kind of balance out those Th1, Th2, and Th3 systems. So that, those are some of the things that you can see that can improve yeah. Hashimoto's yeah. patients. That's awesome. So with the Hashimoto's patients, you would actually do the laser directly on the thyroid gland. Is that I, I, yeah, I mean, I, that's what I do because I have a low level laser on higher powered ones. You don't want to even use those near the thyroid because you can create right. some problems. Absolutely. You can create a thyroid storm even, Absolutely. but with these ones, we'll use it there or we'll use it nearby because remember the, just like sunlight is going to stimulate vitamin D that goes globally. The yeah. laser is going to have some changes that go globally. There have been studies on using laser on the leg and seeing neurocognitive changes with laser just applied to the leg. So mm -hmm. I do do that right right there right below it obviously we got to make sure there's no cancer uh in in the thyroid we got to make sure that's that's clear because you don't want to use it over say you know cancerous uh, uh yeah. thyroid tissue and i do want to make that point to the audience because you know we don't want to and just to re-emphasize high you know level lasers should not be used around the thyroid right um the low level lasers can be used around that area but just mm -hmm. like said, you know, we want to make sure we're ruling out cancers and other right. um, pathologies, et cetera. I find it very interesting that it actually is able to help reduce the antibodies, which yeah. is a lot of people really struggle with, you know, in both of our practice, you know, we deal with a lot of Hashimoto's and um, I'm able to help them bring their antibodies down with, you mm. know, a lot of lifestyle factors, make sure right. their diet is changed, cut out gluten, sugars, processed foods, et cetera make sure they're managing their stress, but also using things like low dose naltrexone right. mm -hmm. really helped with reducing mm -hmm. their um, antibodies. But this is, right. this is great that, you yeah. know, there is something that's non-surgical, non-invasive. Over mm -hmm. how long do you feel like, uh, how many treatments have you seen that it actually makes an impact on your antibodies and their symptomatology? Mm. So a good question. I couldn't give you a good objective data on, on how long the antibodies, because usually we're, we're waiting a month or two anyway. So I don't know if it's faster, but we usually see within that 48 week time period, if yeah. they're also complying with all the functional medicine things, of course, yeah. uh, then we usually see that that helps, especially in patients who've had that history of, oh my God, I'm doing everything I can. I'm not eating any, any uh, you know, reactive foods. Why are antibodies still high? We've seen those patients get some improvements within that one to two month time. Now, when it comes to, let's say diabetic, diabetic patients, patients, uh, particularly when we're using our laser that does a non-surgical fat reduction, we oftentimes see changes in one session on their blood sugar levels there. And you know, a lot of times people have Hashimoto's and diabetes stacked together, That's or at least hypoglycemia. Of course, yes. Yeah. So when it comes to the laser, we can see changes in these diabetic patients in that first session to where I actually warn them, hey, listen, make sure, be very diligent with taking your blood sugar because you may see quite a dramatic drop in it and you need to work with your with your prescribing doctor on possibly altering your dosages because you may not need that because i had one kid who he was a type 1 diabetic he came in when he was 27 we started doing the laser for the fat reduction on him and he even had the insulin pump in him and even with the pump and injections he'd never get under 300 after the first session of doing laser, his, he actually crashed down to like 60 on his blood sugar. So it was a huge change. He was able to start, he, st he was able to stop doing the insulin injections with his doctor's supervision. We didn't have him, you know, just do this on his own, but he worked with his doctor to get off that. And they were able to start lowering even what he had on his pump. So there's some really cool things that are out there. They're all off-label uses, but. Mechanism of action. What would you say that that's, what's going on there? One of the things that happening is, is you're regenerating. You're regenerating pancreatic tissue is one of the things that's happening. And the Russians have been doing that since the 70s. 
I did this with my cat uh, kind of accidentally. And in 2008, uh, my wife and I, we don't have- Did your cat get under that laser? <laughs> he got, uh, oh, this one. That was this ah, one. So okay. my, my wife and I, he's our fur baby. We don't have kids. So that's like, uh -huh. he's like our, our, our little child. And right. he was 11. We came home from a weekend out and we found him just limp in the floor. And of course, if you have pets, they never get sick during regular vet hours, right? It's always yeah. after hours. So it's like Saturday at midnight. And so we got to take him to the emergency vet, which, you know, that's a thousand dollars right there. Yeah. You know? But we love him. So, we, you know, I rush him over there. I'm freaking out because he's just unresponsive. They take him, they go back, they run labs on him. They do an ultrasound. They come back with bad news. They say, listen, uh, you've got bad news. Your cat's diabetic. And he, for some reason now has acute necrotizing pancreatitis. His body is attacking, destroying his pancreas. He's got 90% destruction. So we recommend you put him to sleep. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not ready to say goodbye to him. And so I, I asked the doc, well, what are the chances? Like, he said, we don't have any treatment for this. There's nothing you can do. And I've, I'd been using lasers already for four years. So I'm like, well, I'm going to use my laser and see what can happen. So I said, listen, oh, I want to take him home. I want to use the laser. And he's like rolling his eyes. He's saying, the laser's not going to work on this. And I said, well, you want me to put him to sleep? So what difference does it make? Give me a few days. He said, all right, listen, it's today, Saturday. He said, by Wednesday, he probably won't be eating. He'll be yowling and in pain. Then you need to do the humane thing and bring him in and put him to sleep. I said, sure. fair enough. So I took him home and I lasered over his little kitty pancreas. I would do like three minutes twice a day. By Wednesday, he had a voracious appetite. He was up and moving around a lot better and he kept getting better each day. So I took him in for a follow-up appointment on Saturday. So a week later, set him down and the vet looks at him and is like, wow, you know, your cat looks surprisingly good, but don't get your hopes up. You know, we're going to do a follow-up ultrasound. It's probably going to be worse. Uh, and at that point, you'll need to do the humane thing and put him to sleep. So I said, fair enough. He takes him. And uh, he runs the tests, he does the ultrasound, and I can see him through the little, uh, you know, window in the door that he's looking at the slides and I see him scratching his head and he's looking at both of them. He calls over another vet and they're arguing and pointing at things. And then he looks and he sees me and he weighs me in. And I come through the door and he's like, what the hell did you do? I said, why, what, what's wrong? He said, no, 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 nothing's wrong. But yeah. what the hell did you, did you do? He said, look, he said, this is your cat's pancreas last week. He said, it was the worst one we've ever seen. He said, and frankly, I'm gonna be honest with you. We all talked about what an a-hole we thought you were. This crazy chiropractor thought he's gonna use a laser and fix his cat. We all thought you were just a, a real piece of work. He said, but this is his, his ultrasound from today. You just regenerated 80% of his pancreas in one week. And we've never seen this before. What the hell did you do? He said, this is now a normal pancreas for an 11 year old cat. And I just said, look, I just used my lasers on there. I was just hoping to try to stimulate stem cells to regenerate some tissue. He's like, well, you just did. And so he, next thing you know, he's got signs up all over for laser, doing laser on animals there. But the really cool long-term thing on this is that he told me that my cat was going to need like four units of insulin twice a day for the rest of his life. And he'd probably only have that work one to two years. And then his insulin receptors would burn out. Well, I kept using the laser on him and we got him down from four units to three to two, then to one, and then to where he only needed three quarters of a unit, either once a day or once every other day. And he didn't live just one or two years. He lived six more years to the age of 17. Wow. So, what a great story for all yeah. the covers out there. This is an amazing yeah. story. And it makes you think, you know, if um, we tend to, in our field, we, uh, we believe in what we do so much yeah. and so, with so much zest that I always have this, and you know, I've, I've dealt with this for the last four years with my husband's ALS because there's no treatments, there's no right. cures. And, um, and my, my whole thing is, you know, do no harm. Right. If it's not going to do any harm, then let's give right. it a shot because there's nothing else out there. As long as it makes scientific sense. Right. right? Mm -hmm. To me, it almost feels like this laser where it is stimulating your stem cells, it's stimulating your you know, decreasing inflammation, it's stimulating your glutathione, it's stimulating right. nitric oxide, it's stimulating your ATP. Right. I'm definitely um, going to be looking at buying one for my practice and uh, yeah. offering it to my patients. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, anytime that you find something that is non-invasive, non-surgical, and really enhances your body's own abilities to heal is, exactly. a, win, is a win, right? Absolutely. It's a win. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned, uh, and I want to just go back to this just for a minute. You mentioned autonomic dysfunction. Yeah. Have you treated anybody with POTS um, with these lasers? And have you had any um, 
any improvements? Yeah, I have. I've had not a, not a lot, but I, I have it again, you know, obviously looking at what's the underlying dysfunction there with those patients. A lot of times we'll laser also over the adrenal glands too. Uh, there's some cool studies that I believe it was Columbia university did on the urconia lasers with kidney function and saw some changes with the urconia lasers for, for kidney function. So with the adrenal sitting on top of there being part of POTS, we'll do the laser in there to support that. And then what I usually do with those patients or anytime there's dysautonomia is we'll get the laser on the brainstem. So and that's where I can rotate this laser to, to be positioned around different parts of the brain. So if I need the brainstem and the frontal lobe, we'll do that. And then a lot of times uh, what I've done with patients with any kind of dysautonomia is we can put a blood pressure cuff or a pulse, uh, pulse oximeter on them or, you know, to check their pulse and have them try to do like, in a sense, almost a biofeedback of watching their pulse and seeing the changes while the laser is on them. Uh, many times too, doing vagal nerve exercises while they're, uh, while they're on there too. And we do see improvements with many of those, many of those patients. Yeah. yeah, it almost seems like, you know, when we can trigger the parasympathetic um, mm -hmm. pathways in our, yep. in our bodies, I think that that is going to determine and improve a lot of different things in our lives, right? Because we Definitely. want to live in a parasympathetic state rather than a right. fight or flight sympathetic state. Well, yeah. Go on forever, Dr. Garrett. This With that, can I just add one thing real quick yeah, in there? So, yeah, because as you mentioned, parasympathetic. So, this is a cool thing I just want to show you, your yeah. listeners here, too. So, when we look at the red lasers, the red lasers have a good impact on the parasympathetic nervous system. They actually have that calming impact. So, if we have someone coming in saying they're having anxiety, we find that if we get the laser on them, the red lasers, you can see that calm down. You can even see the blood pressure and the heart rate calm down. The violet has more of a sympathetic stimulation. So, you know, certain patients need that. It's not as common. But the nice thing is when we have a red and a violet combination, as we're putting in those two different types of energies, the body is amazing because it figures out what it needs and balances itself out with those two stimulations on there. So patients will often ask, well, what if you need this stimulation or that stimulation on the patient? We can still apply that device and the body's going to kind of balance itself out. Take what it needs. Exactly. Yeah. Because your sick cells will respond differently than healthy cells. Yes, yes. And you have a combination of those at every part of your body. There is one more thing that I think yeah. you mentioned that I, uh, I think it's important for the listeners to um, hear, especially with the pandemic. Um, you mentioned how it um, does address viruses, parasites, right. microbes, right? Right, right. Um, have you ever used the laser for people who come in with different infections, upper respiratory yeah. or other kinds of infections, or if they have, you know, different mycotoxins, parasitic? Yeah. What has been your experience with the lasers? Yeah, so my, my first big experience with that would be with my sister. Actually, my sister got MRSA on her thigh in 2008 when I first got the combination violet and red laser. And she called me up and she said, hey, little bro, I'm really worried. I've got this MRSA infection. It's six inches in diameter. It's starting to streak to my abdomen and the antibiotics are not working. Is there anything you have that can work? And I said, you know what? I just got this laser. I saw it's got, you know, some, some research on it for, you know, microbes and whatnot, let's give it a shot and see, obviously you're still gonna do what's prescribed by your medical doctor, but let's see if we can help your immune system. So the antibiotics weren't working. So what we did is we get the laser and we put it directly over the area of the lesion and then also laser the nerve roots that go to that area. And what was cool with my sister was that after that first uh, week of sessions, it went from six inches to three inches. After the second week, it went from three to one. Third week, it went from one to zero and was gone for about a month, came back one more time, lasered it one more time and then it was gone. Prior to that, she had issues with chronic kind of staph infections. And now this is 13 years later. I don't believe she's had one since. So that was the first one that um, I say with myself, I got COVID early on in the pandemic before anybody knew what it was. And I had every single symptom. I was flying a lot to teach doctors. So my immune system was weakened, flying a lot to the East Coast. And uh, I got started with a horrible sore throat and the cough and the headache, the fevers that would come up so high that I would not only soak my clothes, but soak my sheets. And when I went to the medical doctor, they weren't aware of COVID yet. And they're just like, well, this is some new respiratory virus that we're seeing and it's doing some weird things. I had one of my patients had caught it. And that's where I got it from. His wife ended up in the ICU with organ failure. And so it happened to me. My my pulse oxygenation was getting down into the uh, into the 80s, into the high 80s, and I was out of breath just to go up my stairs or to talk to people. And then again, when I saw my medical doctors, I didn't really have anything for it at the time, and I was concerned at how I wasn't getting better and at how I just I couldn't breathe. And so I started using my violet laser on myself, and I would laser my tonsils, laser the thymus in the middle of the chest, and laser the gut. There's some cool studies showing that when you laser over the gut, you actually have a positive impact on the microbiome in there. And then we know that these violet wavelengths, there's there's numerous studies showing that. 
the violet laser will will calm down interleukin-6, which is the kind of really bad inflammatory guy with, say, with COVID, and it increases interleukin-10, which is like a master regulator of the cytokines. And so when you can increase interleukin-10, that's the one that kind of puts the brakes on other things. And there was one particular study on acute respiratory distress syndrome showing that with uh, visible red, also with green, and also with blue lasers, that they were able to, at a low dosage, they were able to help these patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome and to even help to heal up some of the scarring in the, in the lungs because it creates the, you know, those stem cells. So yeah, we've seen that. I've had numerous patients who will come in for other things and, and they might mention, oh, I'm feeling a little under the weather. We'll hit their, their tonsils, their thymus and the other area. And a lot of times they'll say, oh my God, I felt so much better when I got home. Um, we also use it for patients have like root canals. We'll use this to enhance their recovery, also to help them with the infection while they're, you know, dealing with it from the orthodontist. Wow. Great. You know, my husband's a dentist, so that's oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's yes. Today. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. Well, Kirk, it was so great to have you here with us today. We Thank you for having me on. So many wonderful things. And uh, uh, to all the listeners, if you want more information from Dr. Gare, you can join his Facebook group, Gare's Patient Health and Performance Secrets. Remember, if you're considering lasers for treatments of any ailments you might be experiencing, check out your local laser center or Dr. Gear's office if you're in the LA area. He's out mm. in Los Angeles. Mm. And uh, with that, thanks for your expertise, Dr. Gear. It was lovely to have you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. You bet. Thank you so much for making time for today's podcast with Get Well with Dr. Shell. I know that this conversation and education can help you to create your best life possible on every level. So definitely tune in to hear the newest expert and learn the latest protocols to support your best health journey. You can learn more about me and my wellness center at drshell.com, D-R-S-H-E-L.com. And I hope that you will make time to come visit us in the Houston area to take a deep dive on self-care. My team and I are completely devoted to helping you live a better life from the mo- from this moment forward. The best days of your life are ahead of you. I promise. This podcast is a powerful and simple way to carry the wisdom of thought leaders from around the world in your pocket and continue to develop your own healing journey every single day. So let the journey begin.